my pleasure to introduce uh, the speaker today, Said Harun. He has a degree uh, in geology at the Institute of Geology, University of Punjab in Pakistan, a master's from King Fahd University of Petroleum and Minerals in Saudi Arabia, and a PhD from Southeast Asia Carbonate Research Laboratory, University Technology Petronas in Malaysia. Uh, his 11 years of experience uh, include um, projects in academia and industry, working in collaboration with Saudi Aramco, Halliburton, Weatherford, Shell, Petronas, several companies, and Kinfa University of Petroleum and Minerals, University of Technology, Petronas. He has led several field trips in the Salt Range, Sub Himalaya, Himalayas for undergrads, postgraduates at Sagora University and University Professors from the Center of Excellence in Mineralogy, University of Baluchistan, Pakistan. He also has supervised and co-supervised about 50 uh, thesis field reports students from different universities in Pakistan on the salt range. He's also a teacher, author, salt range geologist, storyteller, and video creator at Geology Inside YouTube channel. But just a summary of his amazing biography. Said, welcome. Uh, yeah, thanks, Clara. Uh, it's, I'm very humble and uh, very much honored to be here. And uh, hello, uh, good morning, uh, good evening, and good afternoon, according to your time zones. And uh, I'm already seeing that 80 plus uh, participants uh, in this session. I think people want to know more about Pakistan and uh, its geology. So it's very amazing. And uh, today- uh, Oh, sorry, please you... can you share your screen? Oh, okay. Just, yeah. just a second. Okay. All right. Can you see? Yeah, I can. Yeah, that's great. Okay, good. Uh, I will lead you to one of the field museums uh, in geology that is known as uh, Salt Range. Firstly, I would like to thank uh, the organizers of uh, AAPG Salt Piston Technical Interest Group, uh, the salt people around and uh, giving me the opportunity, especially Rachel, for reaching me and uh, asking me for a presentation uh, about uh, salt range uh, in Pakistan. Uh, we will uh, lead through the presentation. And uh, before uh, I go into the details, uh, I'm uh, Dr. Harun and uh, I started uh, most of my, let me take, okay, oh, I'm uh, Dr. Harun and uh, I did my uh, bachelor's and uh, master's from University of the Punjab, mainly uh, the field works uh, that I did were located in the salt range. And then uh, I, I did my uh, master's from King Fahd University of Petroleum that was mainly on the silicic elastic carbonate ramps. Later on, uh, I did my uh, PhD in, uh, and I did my uh, defense this year in 2020, the COVID year. And uh, I did my PhD in sedimentology and understanding the diagenesis of uh, myosin carbonate buildups in uh, offshore Sarawak, Malaysia. However, during the time I was in touch and was uh, writing papers on the salt range with my professors from Pakistan. And uh, I was uh, very much involved in the, in the work. So we, wherever we start something, it's always good uh, that we start with some history. So uh, the history of salt range is uh, quite old. The world salt range was first used by Elphinstone. He was a British convoy to the court of Kabul. In 1815, he visited the territory 
and named it as a salt range. However, the Himalayan rock salt history dates back to the time of uh, Alexander when one of his uh, horses uh, started licking one of the stone and uh, the army man, uh, he also noticed the same thing happening. And then he grabbed the stone and he licked it as well. And uh, he come up with the idea, okay, this is salt. We discovered some salt. This is the pink Himalayan salt that is known worldwide. It is from this area. It is from this location. Later on, the Janjua uh, Rajputs uh, from the Punjab province ruled the territory and uh, governed the, uh, the uh, salt mines. Later on, uh, British uh, revolutionized the salt mining. And uh, you can see some of the salt that is present here uh, is from the salt range. Salt range uh, is known as uh, Field Museum of Geology. There are several reasons of it because of uh, some excellent gorges uh, that represent geology from uh, Precambrian to tertiary, especially the famous one are Kyoda, Nilavan, Varsha, Namal, and Chichali. The other importance is the gigantic deposits of rock salt ranging from 800 to 2000 meters in thickness very beautiful roadside geology wherever the road the motorway the highway cuts it it's best exposed geology very rich fossils especially the stratified rocks such as the carbonate uh, succession of permian the upper carbonates are very important and very significant in the area then we have an era boundary that uh, is present in the western part of the salt range that is from permian to triassic marine sections. And we have ammonites, uh, especially the ceratite, that uh, based on that suture, you can uh, categorize the Triassic sequence. That brings us to the major contributors. The major contribution uh, in the salt range area, it's all started with a small variety of uh, Fleming. In 1834, like 200 years ago, approximately, he uh, made a diary and he noted the uh, salt range and Pindadar Khan, that is a town located in the salt range. And he noted some salt uh, range uh, formations and some stratigraphy of the area. Vin uh, in 1878 was the first one to report Cambrian from the sequence, uh, from the stratigraphic sequence. Then we had Wagon who reported Brachiopores from the Permian then we had Davis and the Pinfold working on the tertiary larger forums. Uh, the most significant contribution so far has been from G, Dr. G. He mapped the salt range uh, in six sheets and he's resolved a controversy that was existing in the salt range, especially the salt range formation. So salt range is actually the oroclinal uh, belt that exists here. And the salt information is the infracambrian part of it, the infracambrian sequence. We call it salt information. So the salt information uh, was uh, told to be uh, based on some tertiary uh, fossils, was called as Eocene. But he mapped the salt range from east to west, spent seven years straight, and then he come up with the idea that no, it is actually thrusted on the recent uh, sediments of the Punjab plain. We'll see it shortly. Then we have a professor and a student, Sinda Wolf and Slaffer, giving birth to the uh, science of trace fossils, reporting uh, Cambrian trace fossils from this area. Then we had Huck working on smaller forums, Grant reporting the youngest uh, trilobite from Permian in the region. Then we had Kumel and Tucker working mainly on Permian brachiopods. We had uh, Fatimi based on the Siratite uh, suture, he categorized the Triassic. Then we had Ashraf and Bhatti working on nanofossils of Patala and Namal formation, mainly Paleocene, Eocene succession. And then we had Samini and Pat mainly uh, working on the Paleocene biostratigraphy. So overall, the researchers from international and local uh, academia and industry have always been uh, uh, I've always been surprised 
and amazed by the wealth of knowledge that exists in this area. And it has already always been a size, uh, a site of attention for students from the first year, from the first semester to the professors in their uh, late careers or to the researchers. Okay, where is the location? Uh, we are here. This is the country, Pakistan. It is bordered by India, Afghanistan, Iran, China, and the Central Asian Tajikistan. Here we have uh, Punjab province uh, that is actually named based on these one, two, three, four, five rivers. And uh, that's why it is called Punjab. In the northern part of this province, we have this uh, physiographic map. Uh, we have a, an uh, elevation map, and you can see that this area is actually uh, elevated from the plain areas that are present towards the south. We call these plains as Punjab plains. And this is the salt range. This is the area where the salt was reported, and later on, the salt has been extracted and mined, and it also has imprint on the geology. If we see the, uh, this is the capital Islamabad, uh, about 100 kilometer away from the Islamabad located on the main motorway that connects Islamabad with Lahore, that is the capital of Punjab. And Islamabad is the capital of the country. Uh, it's about 130 kilometers from the uh, capital. And uh, you can drive uh, through the motorway. Motorway actually cuts across the strike of the salt range, and you can see beautiful exposures that are present there. Where in Himalayas, uh, as we are part of the Himalayan orogeny, uh, the most famous uh, thing that most people know is the Himalayas. Himalayas coming from uh, Myanmar, Bhutan, Nepal, and then coming from Pakistan to Afghanistan. We will be considering the northwestern part of Himalaya, and we will be looking that in more detail. Here we have the subdivisions of uh, uh, Ganser, who subdivided the Himalayas into higher Himalayas, lesser Himalayas, and sub-Himalayas. These subdivisions are actually based on some regional thrust faults that run from the western side to the eastern side of Himalayas. Here we have the higher Himalayas that are uh, present in the northernmost part and uh, uh, that are bounded by the main Karakoram thrust. And the southern part is the main mantle thrust where we have ophelites as well. Then we have the uh, uh, lesser Himalayas uh, from MMT until the MBT. And uh, this is the main boundary thrust fault. And this is the area where we have lesser Himalayas. The interesting part that we will be focusing on is this one. And this is the sub Himalayas part. And the salt is actually present the, in this, this one. And uh, the structural style is changed uh, because in the lesser Himalayas and higher Himalayas, there is more involvement of the basement. However, in the sub-Himalayan part, there is more involvement of the uh, salt that provides the decolumy, and that provides the uh, and uh, that provides actually avoids the basement from the region. The thrusts, however, from north to south become uh, younger. And uh, we have uh, the age of the faults uh, becoming younger as we move from the higher Himalayas, lesser Himalayas to the sub Himalayas. Oh, this is the sub Himalayan part. Uh, this is the sub Himalayan part. And you can see that uh, this is the uh, margin of this uh, salt range that is called the salt range thrust in which the decolumy happened and uh, that moved the salt range and the Potohar basin on the Punjab plains. You can also notice uh, there is a strike slip fault. We will talk uh, shortly about it. Here we have the stratigraphy. Now we need to know what are the ages 
of different stratigraphic units that are present in this particular area that we call the salt range. Now we have the uh, salt range formation that is the oldest exposed unit in the area. However, the base of this unit is not exposed. This is the salt range formation. Age is infracambrian. Okay. Now we have. few major uh, unconformities. Uh, the stratigraphy looks like a geological time scale with formations uh, from infracambrian to uh, Pleistocene. However, we have few regional breaks, uh, the breaks that can be traced across the continent. We have uh, a Cambrian to Permian break. Then we have a break from Cretaceous to tertiary, that is the KT boundary. Then we have the break when the deposition center changed uh, due to the collusion of the Indian plate with the Eurasian plate. And then we had a break uh, from the uh, um, Sivalix to the uh, most recent sediments that have the class from the older formations. However, there is additional uh, para conformity that is the era boundary and very significant and has uh, always been the site of uh, research from researchers all around the world. Here we have uh, uh, productus, the brachiopod that changes into uh, the fauna changes into uh, ceratite and that marks the boundary of an era. Let's move to more detail about the stratigraphic units and to see that how the basin configuration has changed over the time and how the basin has shifted from uh, one type to another. And here we have the uh, infracambrian uh, salt range formation. Salt is reported from Oman, from Iran and from other parts of the Indian basins that was mainly result of the rift basin and it is mostly composed of rock salt, gypsum and uh, evaporites, uh, dolomite, marl and uh, some oil shale. Then we had the shift from the rift basin to a passive margin and that passive margin is actually the site of shallow marine clastics having trilobite fossils. Then we had a significant unconformity that later on shifted the environment to become continental. And uh, we had the glacial uh, sequences that also relate to the configuration of uh, Pangaea and the Gondwana land. And then later on, we had the uh, presence of uh, a shallow shelf carbonate fossiliferous, especially the productus rich uh, limestones of uh, upper Permian. Then we had uh, open marine conditions in the Triassic that changed from uh, open marine to become a carbonate shelf at the end of the Triassic that changed into uh, more like uh, deltaic to oolitic sense, oolitic limestones of uh, Samana Stuk formation in the middle of Jurassic, later on again restricting the environment. And then at the end, we have the shallow marine sandstones uh, clastics at the end of the Cretaceous. Here we have the uh, flight of India, uh, the, the place where we had the uh, Indian plate joined with Madagascar about 80 million years ago. And then there was rifting started here. And as a result of that rifting, that uh, ridge push Indian plate started moving uh, from uh, its location with the Gondwana land and started moving towards the north and eventually it collided with the Eurasian continent. The important thing is uh, the change in the basin style. Uh, from here, it mostly remained as a passive margin until it reached and contacts with the Eurasian plate about 40, 45 million years ago and then changing the basin from a passive margin to one of the four land or four deep basins 
that mainly receive the sediments from the erosion of Himalayas and formerly known as the Siwaliks. Here we have the details of uh, what happened at that particular time. And we had the uh, variable sequences of uh, sandstones. And uh, we also have some deposition of uh, uh, marine carbonate ramps uh, in the middle of uh, Paleocene after the KT boundary. Then we have a very strange development of uh, nummulitic limestones uh, in the Eocene with the uh, deposition of Namal, Skesar, and Chorgali formations. Then later on, complete shift in the basin style and also the uh, type of sediments to fluvial, fluvial deltaic sediments at the uh, Miocene. With later on, more thrust sheets coming in, and then we had the erosional products of. Uh, uh, Himalayas and later on valley field deposits, uh, especially rich with the Eocene classes. Now we come to the next part that is the subdivisions of the salt range. So salt range area is actually divided into eastern part, into the central part and into the western part. Here uh, in the eastern part, uh, we can also see some uh, structural configuration that are drawn in the lower side. So this is the eastern part and this is the western part. And in the center, we have the central salt range. Local geologists who are from the country, they might know that the eastern salt range extends from Jogitilla, that is the location, to the Kyora. And from Kyora to Varsha, that is the central part. From here to here, that is the central and the most widest part. And from uh, the uh, Varsha to Kalabagh area is the western part of the salt range. The important thing is the trend of the folds uh, that changes from uh, northeast southwest in the eastern part, become east west in the central part, and then it becomes northwest southeast in the western salt range. And the role of salt range formation, the infracambrian uh, evaporites, the sequence that uh, we are interested in, is more significant in the central part of the salt range or the central salt range. Here we see a few of the strike slip faults that are demarcating the eastern extent of the salt range that is called the Jhelum fault. It is a transform fault. And then we have another transform fault that is located on the western side of the salt range, and it is called the Kalabakh fault. Here, this is the line that demarcates the place where the decolme happened along the salt range formation. Along this thrust, we have the presence of the salt range formation that is exposed and that marks the extent until which salt range is present. And then we have the Punjab plains in the south. This is the location of this salt range in, in the country. And then you see uh, we have various colors that are representing uh, different type of rocks as we are moving from south towards the north. And interestingly, the Paleozoic sequences are present and then we have the Paleogene sequences, and then we have the presence of the younger Siwaliks. However, there are some differences in terms of which type of formations are present in Eastern salt range, Central salt range, and Western salt range, because the basin has changed uh, the configuration through the geological time. Here we have the wall of uh, stratigraphy or uh, wall of lithostratigraphy that is located in the eastern part of the salt range. And you can see different colors and those colors are having various type of lithologies that are located from uh, that range in age from the salt range formation to the tertiary. We have reddish malls that are present in the south uh, sorry, that is present uh, uh, down. And then we have the purple sandstone that overlies the salt range formation. Salt range formation is actually uh, consists of marl 
it consists of salt it consists of gypsum so these are the main uh, uh, lithologies that are present in the salt rain formation then we have purple sandstone cambrian in age then we have another cambrian uh, we have uh, micaceous sandstone of kasak formation then we have uh, ridge forming uh, dolomites of jutana formation and then we have the uh, reddish uh, bagamala formation that is also from cambrian so until here we have infra cambrian and this is cambrian and the cambrian stops here and then we have the permian sequence the greenish yellowish sequence is permian and then the whitish sequence on the top is actually the tertiary sequence uh, that caps the uh, the valley now you can see that we can have exposure of uh, various formations uh, along a stream along a river bed now let's talk about some of the salt tectonic features that are present especially in the central salt range uh, that we call the salt uh, diaperic structure or salt related structure here the phenomena is very uh, important like if you want to uh, categorize salt range what happened there uh, you can say that the first thing is the deposition of um, all the uh, materials and then we have the tectonics the himalayan tectonics that actually thrusted the salt range and then later on the erosion erosion is mainly controlling the uh, after after uh, compressional tectonics now in the salt range area erosion is the main control here is a stream uh, we locally call it as hamtat nala and you can see that it is cutting this valley and in this valley we have exposures of uh, uh, infra cambrian to cambrian to uh, uh, permian and then uh, tertiary and this stream uh, has a very narrow valley however the adjoining uh, synclines are quite broader and they it is a very unique feature of salt tectonics that exist especially in the central part of the salt range and uh, here the erosion is the main uh, governing uh, governing force here we have a photograph from one of the domes that are present uh, in the uh, central part of the salt range here we have due to erosion the upper sequence of the dome has been eroded and now we have the salt range formation that is actually coming and then we have the uh, cambrian and permian sequences that are bordering this dome from the outer side normal faulting is also one of the uh, significant feature i will show you uh, in a while here we have a broad syncline that is uh, one of the uh, features from the central part of the salt range and a very uh, sharp anticline you can just see the edge of that uh, that is present in the crowley area and then we have one of the uh, anticlinal axis that is also very uh, sharp and then you can also notice the dips of the uh, the beds that are dipping away from each other and here the uh, river or the stream uh, it erodes and it erodes until the salt and then uh, we have the uh, salt coming uh, from the down and uh, sometimes the mals are um, uh, cropping out and then we have this is the side of one of this nala uh, the uh, the side of the uh, nilavan gods or the nilavan nala that is present in the central salt range here we have uh, one village uh, that is this village and it is actually located on the eocene and this village is bordered by two uh, normal faults that is uh, uh, generated as a result of the uh, the behavior of the salt because the salt keeps on moving towards the uh, towards the area uh, of uh, erosion where we have uh, one of the streams and uh, you can also notice that uh, this area has a very uh, tight uh anticline that has been eroded eventually and then we have some broader synclines in the region and uh, 
we can also notice that this is uh, the eocene that has been um, uh, normal faulted and then this is the permian sequence that borders this uh, valley where the village of Karoli is located now we will see some atlas some features from the uh, salt range formation the formations that we discussed now i want to show you some gallery so you get an appreciation virtual field work because of the covid conditions uh, all of us are uh, having some uh, uh, problem in going to the field so we will try to take you to one of the uh, locations here we have a uh, red color mals uh, mainly from the salt range formation uh, this is this area is the kyoda gorge the area where every geologist from pakistan has to go it is mandatory for all the geologists to once uh, in their degree program they have to go to this location and to see and appreciate the uh, the gigantic geology that is present there in the lower photograph you can notice some uh, gypsum as well and uh, the himalayan pink salt one of the mines uh, in the eastern part of the salt range you can see the uh, significant pink color of this himalayan salt here we have some uh, uh, paleosols from the cretaceous tertiary boundary that uh, i talked in the uh, stratigraphic column and uh, these uh, uh, paleosols sometime have very good development of clay horizons sometime bauxite sometime laterite that can be industrial industrially extracted and is being done uh, as we speak we have a uh, supridal supridal weathering uh, that is present in the miocene kamlial formation and uh, that is a typical feature of this miocene formation that is present in the northern part of the salt range and for carbonate sedimentologist if there is anybody listening we have some uh, very good uh, ramp carbonates with uh, very good secondary porosity may be related to the exposure in the eocene limestones of the uh scaser limestone that are present in the salt range then we have a very sharp contact between uh, one of the uh, sandstones the micaceous sandstones of the kasak formation with the uh, sandy dolomites of uh, jutana formation so it is uh, a very sharp so it it has you can say that uh, we have a shallow marine plastics changing into Uh, somewhat carbonate uh, sandy carbonate type of environment and then we have uh, some uh, uh, cambrian uh, bagamala formation and uh, then you can see some of these uh, conglomerates the glacial conglomerates that are present on the top this line represents the million of years from cambrian to permian unconformity the area was exposed and uh, was subjected to erosion and uh, stuff here we have some um, uh, trace fossils uh, especially from the early cambrian so if you are interested in the trace fossils uh, uh, you are welcome especially the early cambrian then we have some ceratites i also have some samples i will show you shortly after i just Uh, finish these slides so i want to show you some samples as well so this ceratite is uh, from uh, triassic and uh, mainly present in the western part of the salt range here we have the glacial deposits of the permian the early permian that are being overlain by the tidal flat of uh, uh, dendroth formation of permian and then we have um, uh, interlaid of limestone and marl Uh, that is present uh, in the eastern part of the salt range and uh, very beautiful sequences nummulitic uh, limestones then we have reddish uh, clays of the sivalix this is the sivalix outcrop uh, that is just present uh, north of the salt range where we have the transition uh, from salt range to the potohar plateau that is mostly underlain by the sivalix and we have the contact between the chingi formation and the nagri formation then we have the sharp contact between a carbonate ramp of uh, skesser limestone is actually an unconformity and the uh, uh, miocene uh, fluvio uh, deltaic um, kamlial formation 
let us see some of the structural features. We have some microfolding um, that is mainly uh, present in the laterites of Hangu formation that is uh, Paleocene just after the Cretaceous Paleocene or Cretaceous tertiary boundary. Then we have some uh, folding and uh, controlled mainly by the lithology that is present in the, one of the Cambrian sequences in the eastern part of the salt range. Then we have flexural slip folding that is present in the uh, eastern part of the salt range, mainly in the Jutana formation, the Jutana dolomites. And then we have some intense folding uh, that is intense folding, or you can say shearing type of materials that is present in one of the uh, deep gorges uh, that we visited. Here we have some uh, gravity, or uh, you can say that uh, some uh, salt controlled uh, subsurface salt controlled features uh, that developed in the step faulting in one of the peaks in the eastern salt range. And uh, this step faulting is mainly in Cambrian to Permian sequence. Then we have one of the uh, anticlines that is present in the Eocene Caesar limestone that can be used to understand the origin of the salt range and can be uh, upgraded to understand it. Then we have some uh, systematic and non-systematic joints that can also be associated with one of the stress regimes and we can decipher. Okay, uh, talking about the salt range, let's see some of the mineral potential, very huge uh, mineral potential. You can see there are various formations that are present in this uh, salt range area. The first most important is of course the pink Himalayan salt. It is uh, present uh, throughout the eastern, uh, central and the western part of the salt range. Then we have the gypsum deposits that also is very important for the cement industry as well. We have the building stones uh, from the purple sandstone of Cambrian to the uh, dolomites in uh, Cambrian to, to some dolomites in the Triassic. And then we have the bauxite that normally developed uh, as a result of the uh, unconformity product of um, uh, Cretaceous to tertiary. China clay also uh, associated with some Permian to Paleocene, Eocene formations. Then we have coal. Uh, Sometimes the layer is 1.5 to 2 meters in thickness and mainly present in the eastern part of the salt range and very famous coal mines that, that are present there. And we have some laterite, um, also a very uh, good product for the industry uh, from pre EOC formations of uh, uh, central salt range. Then we have bentonite clays that are present in the Sivalix in the northern part of the salt range. Then we have the fire clay deposits from uh, Miyawali, Kushab, and Chakwal. Actually, it, this salt range extends from four districts, four to five districts in Pakistan. So these are the name of the districts. Then we have the iron ore. Uh, Kalabag iron ore that is present in the western part of the salt range. Limestone, we have huge variety of limestone in the salt range area. We have uh, limestones from Jurassic, we have limestones from Paleocene, we have limestones from Eocene that can be used in multiple uh, projects and multiple objectives. However, we also have very good quality of silica sand deposits that are mainly located in the western part of the salt range, uh, especially the Jurassic Data Formation. Let's uh, not forget the petroleum system. Uh, just north of the salt range, we have a very uh, beautiful petroliferous basin. And you will be surprised that the first well uh, was uh, uh, drilled just uh, seven years after the uh, famous Pennsylvanian uh, well here, uh, very near to the salt range. We call it as Kundal. And uh, these are some of the source rocks that are present in the salt range area, uh, the black uh, dots. And uh, let's see the reservoirs. Yes, reservoirs are also uh, present from Cambrian to late Permian, to Triassic, to Jurassic, to uh, Paleocene and Eocene. And if we see the uh, Cap rocks, uh, cap rocks, of course, are also present from Cambrian to early, uh, early Permian. And then we have uh, early Triassic, late Jurassic. And then we have uh, uh, early Permian, uh, Miocene, and 
all the Siwaliks are considered as a cap rock or a seal rock in the region. So these are some of the publications. Uh, if you guys are more interested to learn about the salt range and also the to learn more about the salt tectonics in the region, because this is huge area and uh, it's very uh, difficult to cover each and everything uh, in uh, one go. So if you are interested, I can send you the PDFs of these papers. And uh, I want to thank uh, my friends uh, and uh, my professors at the University of the Punjab. And uh, this these photograph is with one of the uh, miners, the coal miners, uh, who hosted us for one month during uh, our field work uh, like 10 years ago. This is me quite eroded and rusted uh, with these uh, uh, salt range. And uh, these are my group mates uh, doing well uh, in various companies and uh, various organizations. Uh, I want to thank my supervisor at that time, uh, Professor uh, Nazir. Uh, and uh, also I want to thank uh, Professor Shahid Ghazi. And uh, I also want to thank uh, uh, Professor Sheikh and uh, Professor Nazami, Professor Aftab Ahmed Bhatt for their kindness and guidance always during the field and uh, after the field. And uh, they are my mentors and they still mentoring me uh, to this day. So oh, thank you very much to the uh, SALT community for giving me time, listening me and uh, listening to my stories as uh, I am a storyteller. And uh, also I'm running a, a YouTube channel with the name of Geology Insight and uh, also a Facebook group. So thank you all. Thank you, Saad. Thank you so much. Um, well done. That's an interesting talk. So we will now open this up for questions. And please uh, feel free to push out questions into the live uh, QA box or the chat window. Okay. Um, so I've got a, we can start with um, a question from Khadija. And the question is, is salt formation also found or exposed in other parts of the world? Yes, I think uh, salt uh, is exposed in uh, many areas uh, in Iran and uh, where I have seen a uh, few of the field photographs. So yes, salt is exposed and uh, it depends on the region if it is the climate, uh, if it is arid or uh, if it is humid, so it, because of the dissolution. So uh, yes, uh, outcrops are present of salt. Okay, that's great. We've got another question from anonymous attendee and um, it says, why is it called decolum? And why is the basement, okay. why are they not exposed? Okay, so uh, decolum is a, a fault in which the salt provides the uh, the level at which the uh, formations are thrusted. So uh, the thrust level is not extended to the basement. So the basement is uh, like normal faulted in this region and the uh, thrust fault that is basically the decolume and uh, that decolume happened and the salt range was pushed on the Punjab plains. I hope I answered the question. Yeah. We will uh, carry on with another question. Um, so someone else wants to know why are there fossils present at that age? Which age? Mm, I guess maybe at the age of the, um, within the salt range itself. Um, so they've not been specific yeah. about okay. so the we actual... have. Uh... Yeah, we have uh, a range of uh, fossils uh, from uh, Cambrian, uh, that is uh, the preserved part of uh, fossils, especially the trilobite trails. And I haven't been, uh, haven't seen uh, myself uh, fortunate enough. You need to be very, having very good luck to find one of the trilobites. However, 
We also have uh, fossils in the Permian, especially the Upper Permian and uh, Triassic that is very rich uh, with fossils and also the Paleocene and Eocene successions are rich in fossils. Okay, thank you. Um, we've got another question from Mohammed, and um, he wants to know why is the salt pink in color? Okay, uh, I think the uh, the pink color is because of the impurity. So uh, maybe due to the presence of some uh, clay minerals, or maybe due to some presence of uh, potassium uh, laden minerals that uh, are associated with this uh, salt. Okay, thanks, Said. Um, we've got another question from Hassan, and is asking about what is the environment of deposition of the carbonate deposits? Okay, uh, we have a range of uh, carbonate uh, deposition. Uh, we have the development of a carbonate ramp uh, during the uh, Jurassic, uh, that is uh, especially a ulitic shoal type of environment. And uh, we also have uh, uh, shelf uh, carbonate or ramp carbonates in Eocene. Uh, we have the nummulitic uh, limestones in Eocene. Uh, we have a range of, we can also have uh, in Virgil limestone in uh, Permian, we also have some refill limestone uh, that uh, uh, gives us an idea that the area has been uh, part of a carbonate reef or there was some small reef was present. Okay, I think there's another related question to that. Um, I think I just... Sorry, one minute. Um, okay, so the question says, as we see, there are lots of carbonate rocks found in the salt range. Are there any solution features, for yes. instance, uh, cast found in this region? Yes, we, we have... Uh, uh, we don't have a larger cast development in this area, but we can say that we have minor cast features, especially the larger vugs that are present in some of the exposed units, uh, especially the Eocene and uh, also the Paleocene limestones. We call it Lockhart limestone. We have uh, some uh, dissolution features, but they cannot be uh, compared with what we have in the Middle East. So it's rather smaller than that. Okay, I've got a, another question from um, Nazar. I hope I pronounced that correctly. And um, she, she's uh, commending, commending you for um, a really good uh, presentation. Um, so I think, will you please comment on the rule of salt in deformation before the main Himalayan tectonic? Yeah. Can you can you comment on the role of salt, sorry, in deformation? Okay. Oh, mainly uh, what we see today is the role of salt after the salt has uh, come near to the surface. However, before uh, before the Himalaya, uh, we don't have much traces of that, or maybe we don't have much record of that. Maybe we need to drill more wells in the Punjab plains to understand the behavior of the salt before the Himalayan tectonics. All right. Um, okay, so there's another question from Sam. And they want to know what's the evidence for the start of trusting in the salt range? Uh, sorry. Do you want me to repeat that? Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah. Uh, Sam wants to know what's the evidence? What's the okay. evidence for the start of trusting in the salt mm -hmm. range? Okay, uh, mainly the evidence is the as I uh, show you some of the uh, Cambrian sequences that have the uh, ramp and flat geometry and the uh, shearing uh, that I show you in one of the photographs in the Cambrian sequence starts to increase as we reach near the, uh, the level where the salt information is actually thrusted. And the, uh, also we have the uh, contact in which the salt range formation malls are present on the recent uh, deposits of the Punjab plain. 
uh, that can only happen if we uh, move the uh, whole sequence, the whole package from Precambrian to the Eocene on the Punjab plains. Uh, I think I can't hear you. Uh, maybe your mic is off. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> I muted myself. Um, yeah, so there's a there's a question from Isars saying, why are the oolites present only in the Samanar Sook formation and not anywhere else? Okay, uh, oolites uh, or oolitic limestone, as we know, uh, they represent a oolitic shoal type of environment, and uh, those only happen when we don't have. Uh, uh, the other significant fauna in the succession, or maybe you can say that uh, they have some abiogenic uh, origin, or uh, they they are formed in uh, in areas where we have uh, tidal flat, or where we have uh, carbonate shoal type of environment. So that's why in that area where we don't have uh, carbonate shoals, maybe uh, we had the development of carbonate shoals in during the Jurassic, and other times maybe we had the formation of uh, carbonate ramps and open carbonate ramp and where we have the deposition of the carbonate similar to what we have in the classics. Great. Um, so I've got a question from from uh, Mohammed and he says, are there any radioactive traces or elements in the salt range? Radioactive traces? Yeah. Of of salt range formation? No, are there any radioactive traces or elements within the salt okay, range yes, formation? Yes, we have, uh, especially in the Sivalix, uh, the younger Sivalix that have been resulted from the erosion of Himalaya. So we have uh, uh, radioactive elements, uh, especially uranium and other elements that have been uh, used, been uh, mined from the Sivalix and they are being used. Uh, for the benefit of uh, or in other nuclear energy projects. Okay, um, there's a question from Asif. Why is the Oligocene mason from Upper Indus Basin and present okay. in the form? Mm -hmm. Why is the mason from the Upper Indus Basin? Mm -hmm. And why is it present in the form of Nari clastics in the Lower Indus Basin? Okay, very interesting question. Uh, the idea was that when the Indian plate was moving towards the north and uh, we had the closure of basins, so there was some mini basins were forming at that time. And at that time, uh, the uh, after the Eocene, we had the area maybe exposed or maybe the area went out of uh, water because of the contact of the Indian plate, the initial contact of the Indian plate with the Eurasian plate. And that contact doesn't mean that all parts of the Indian plate were in contact. So there were some areas still receiving sedimentation and that could be the reason. Uh, yeah, okay. So there's a, a question from Nazar. I think we answered that, sorry. Um, I'll go on to another question. So there's another question from saying, how much seismic data is available from the salt range? Is subsurface imaging good enough to see individual trust? Yes, uh, I have some uh, seen some uh, recent uh, papers uh, from one of the scientists and uh, they had some uh, seismic data, especially from the central and the western part of the salt range. And they ac actually show you uh, how the salt has been thrusted on the Punjab plains. So yes, the data is available. And uh, uh, if uh, you need, you can just drop the email. I can send you the paper. Okay. And um, we've got another question from Osama. And he wants to know what are the possible outcomes of the phenomenon of um, halokinesis and mm -hmm. its implication on petroleum system? Okay. Uh, halokinesis is a very important phenomena because uh, it tells us about the movement of salt and controlling uh, salt controlling the tectonic, uh, the non-compressional tectonic that is not related to the Himalayan tectonics because mainly in this region all the thrusts are controlled by the Himalayas. 
however if uh, you see in the central part of the salt range there is more control of salt similarly as i said uh, in the north of the salt range area we have depot r basin and that area is petroliferous so if you understand the behavior of the salt the halogenesis in the central part of the salt range then you can extend that understanding in understanding the uh, areas just north where we have the production of oil and gas and i i, I think it it has a role there Okay, that's great. Um, so a lot of people are commenting you on your presentation as well. So there are lots of comments on here saying this is a nice presentation, and um, and you. also they are happy with your responses. Um, mm -hmm. someone wants to know how the nodules were formed. Okay, so uh, basically the uh, nodules are formed uh, as a result of the deposition of the carbonates, especially when we have the deposition of carbonates on the carbonate ramp. And uh, later on, uh, when we have some uh, clay minerals that are present uh, in the limestone as well, and you do during the diagenesis process, we have the formation of these nodules. However, there is another type of nodules, we call them tectonic nodules, and they are a result of them, some tectonic activity, and they are present in the most, uh, like the lesser Himalayan part of the Himalayas, we can also have the tectonic nodules, but these are more like depositional or diagenetic product. Um, and I think we've got another question. Um, Mudasa wants to know the origination of the Himalayan salts. Where did it come from? The origin of Himalayan salt? Okay. Yeah. Okay, all right. So as I said earlier, uh, at the start of the uh, infracambrian time, we had the creation of rift basins and those rift basins have some restricted environment and that restricting environment allowed for the uh, evaporation of uh, uh, a lot of, uh, 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 like for million of years, that basin remains restricted with very less intake with small streams coming in and bringing in some plastic material that later on changed into mall. However, most part of that basin remained closed and for that closed period, it allowed the evaporites, we had the gypsum and the salt being uh, uh, deposited as a result of that uh, uh, evaporation. Right, that's great. I'm just uh, quickly going through to see if uh, there are other questions to be answered. Um, there's a question from Hafiz and he wants to know, how do we differentiate between tectonic nodules and sedimentary nodules? Okay, uh, tectonic nodules, they typically have an orientation and uh, the sedimentary nodules, they don't have uh, that typical orientation. Uh, that you can say that if uh, there is some imbrication or there is rock slicing, especially in the lesser Himalayas, uh, if particularly he wants to know the location, uh, tectonic nodules, he can see uh, just beside the Qaeda Azam University located in uh, in Islamabad, you can find tectonic nodules uh, there and uh, those tectonic nodules are actually formed due to the uh, continuous uh, imbrication of uh, uh, the uh, MBT and its play faults. So they have some orientation, however, the sedimentary nodules, they don't have some orientation. Okay, I think there's another question on um, if rare at elements are reported here or not. Um, I think you answered something similar to that earlier. Uh, element? No, rare earth elements. Okay. Do we have uh, rare earth elements reported here or not? Uh, I haven't seen any uh, research uh, done so far on the uh, report of rare earth elements. Uh, however, we have a very uh, thin um, igneous uh, body that tops the salt rain formation and could be the product during the rifting. Maybe the basin has some uh, magmatism and uh, maybe uh, it's interesting, interesting question and uh, maybe somebody needs to do that. Good lead for okay. the future. Yeah, okay. Um... I think we've gone through most of the questions. Mm 
Right, okay. Um, okay, there's one more question, I think. So there's um, a question from Sam. Oh, actually, there's one from Ahmed. So he says is uh, from the Center of Excellence in Mineralogy. And his question is about the igneous body seal intruded in one formation in salt range. Would you like to share details about that seal? Yeah, yeah, okay. So we have um, a very interesting question because he's from the Center of Excellence in Mineralogy. So that's why he's more interested in igneous uh, body. We only have one igneous rock that is present just on top of the salt range formation. And uh, that it's very difficult to find its outcrop. And normally when you go to the gorges and uh, streams, you just find some pieces of it. It is a very, uh, we call it locally as curite, that particular rock. And uh, there is some uh, research somebody did. If he is interested, I can share with him. It, uh, the mineralogy of that particular rock is uh, rich in pyroxene mineral. And it's like a pyroxenite type of uh, having some needles of uh, tourmaline. And it's like an ultramafic, uh, you can say that ultramafic type of lava flow of infracambrian time. Okay. Um, do you want to go ahead with the questions? I think there are just a few more. Yeah, yeah, please. It's okay. Okay. All right. So there's a question from Mubasha who says, please tell us about the PT boundary, especially the, the white calcareous sandstone. Yeah. Okay. So uh, that's interesting that I can show you him the sample as well. Uh, we have the uh, Permo-Triassic boundary and uh, you can see that we have uh, a productus, a brachiopod that is a very significant part of it. And uh, this uh, productus limestone is present from the uh, uh, Permian and uh, the the ceratite, maybe if you can see it properly, uh, that is present in one of these uh, rocks. Uh, the ceratite is from the uh, Triassic. So this is the Permo-Triassic boundary. So it is based on the fauna. That's why we call it as paraconformity. And it has attracted uh, the researchers from all over the world uh, to, uh, and it can be considered as one of the tight sections for Permo-Triassic boundary. And it is marked uh, on the base of the white sandstone, where we have the white sandstone, and then we uh, that is the top of the Permian, that is the era boundary, and then later we have a fine uh, iridium layer, a layer that is rich in iridium. Maybe it can um, uh, help us to understand the past climate and past. Maybe it's related to the volcanic eruption that has. Uh, being responsible for the 90% extinction on the planet Earth, and it's very interesting. Okay, that's great. I think I'll, I'll take one more question, and uh, this is from Muhammad, and he says, what is the potential of unconventional resources in the salt range? Well, wow, great. Okay, uh, we have, uh, as I uh, I, I, as I have already presented some of the source rocks that are present in this area. And uh, these source rocks, uh, I am working right now one of the papers uh, in which we are uh, trying to uh, mention one of the source rock as a potential for unconventional, that is the Patala formation. It's still under review and maybe uh, gets published very soon. And in that, we try to incorporate from eastern part of Potohar some wells and then the cohort. And then we try to understand the thickness and the, uh, and we can recommend it as one of the uh, candidate for shale gas or candidate of unconventional. All right, that's great. I think we've uh, gone through most of the questions. Um, yeah, Just if you want the... to see some other samples, I can also show you one or two samples. <laughs> one or two samples? Please do. <laughs> want to see. Yeah, okay. So we uh, we have this one. Uh, this is the trace fossils from the Cambrian, uh, early Cambrian uh, Kasak formation. Maybe uh, viewers can see that uh, the side yeah. view. So this is one of the samples. And then we have some salt pseudomorph uh, that has been um, uh, first the salt crystals were created. And then the maybe you can see these some of the cubic crystals of uh, 
a light that has now been replaced by uh, clay minerals and uh, you can see that there is one crystal so these are some of the maybe the cross sectional view can show you uh, can uh, help you in seeing some of these crystals so this is the one of the cambrian uh, uh, bagamala formation uh, formerly known as salt sudamaf beds uh, it was uh, uh, thought that the salt uh, was basically uh, present and then later on when the clastic influx came in the salt was dissolved and the uh, shape was retained and now this uh, this is actually made of silt and clay but the shape is still of the crystals is of the halite and i also have one sample from uh, uh, laterite of the uh, you can see some of these uh, rhizoids uh, on the cretaceous tertiary boundary that actually uh, help uh, the during the exposure of the uh, area in the salt range these type of uh, lateritic beds uh, were formed so uh, i hope uh, you guys love these samples as well yeah thank you so much that was that's been a, an amazing presentation uh, thank you so much for uh, for for presenting to us today and so during your talk i've been pasting a uh, uh, our email address if um, pe um, if people participants want to uh, uh, contact us or email us and if you have further questions for our site please uh, send that to us we can always uh, pass this on to him um, yep. and I also included in the I think in the key in the chat window sorry uh, the links to uh, AAPG members site if you want to sign up and we also have uh, links to the YouTube channels if you want to um, also go through a replay of all the previous talks. And as a reminder, we are working on the 2021 calendar of SALT webinars and we will share these in due course. So thank you all very much for your support and uh, thank you so much uh, Dr. Said. Uh, for this yeah. brilliant presentation and um, yeah. I just wanted to check with uh, <laughs> any of the panelists if they wanted to say anything else before I close out the webinar. Thank you so much Saeed for presenting and thank you everyone for attending. We were really glad that you were here and um, yeah just follow us on social media for updates and um, you know feel free to send us messages at any time. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you all, and thank you, Dr. Said. Yeah, you are welcome. Have a good and, day. Uh, I am hoping that one day you guys can see the salt train yourself. Yeah, we hope so. <laughs> After the situation gets better. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Take care. Thank you. Bye, Bye, all. Bye. Bye. Bye.